Hello, and welcome to the Writer's Podcast. I'm going to do that again, slightly more fluid. Hello, welcome to the Writer's Podcast. I am Dan Freeman in England, in Cheshire, and opposite um, me... Um, I already messed I'll it say, up. I oh, messed it up. I'm such a dick. Hello, and welcome to the Writer's Podcast, episode two. I am Dan Freeman in Cheshire in England, and sitting directly across the Atlantic from me is... Sean Hurley. I live in New Hampshire. Yeah, I don't need to say I live in New Hampshire. And this is a Sean Hurley, and I am coming... No, I'm not. I hate welcomes. <laughs> I'm coming at you live. <laughs> I don't know what I was saying. This is... It's falling apart, Dan. We can't do this. Opposite me is... Sean Hurley, United States citizen. Congratulations. Disgraceful. It's a podcast for writers who write and who wrong, but to bold men who lend you a pen. I suppose we're all readers who drop through the page to the far side. Now we're wandering strange. You can send us a question, a story, or a poem. Writer's Podcast. Welcome to the Writer's Podcast. As your co-hosts Dan and Sean were disabled from any propensity to even the most mediocre welcome due to a gorgeous lack of skills in several key welcoming departments, they had to hire me, a highly trained professional voice actor at very reasonable rates, to do their job. So that's what this is. Good money on the moon is what I'd call it, me being the moon. At any rate, Sean is a disgraced podcast welcomer, American playwright, television writer, patriot on Amazon Perpetual Grace Limited, and former public radio reporter. Find out more about him on his website, radioghost.com. Across the ocean from Sean. For this is an international podcast that is cobbled together somewhere high over the mid-Atlantic Ocean, is Dan Freeman, disgraced podcast welcomer, English playwright, chanteurs, novelist, comedian, and screenwriter, whose new novel, The Minister of Chance, is out now and can be found on Amazon. You can find out more about Dan on his website, danfreeman.co.uk. On today's show, Sean and Dan discuss the smithereen language and grammar on social media, weigh in on the vagaries of publishing on Kindle versus traditional publishing houses, and settle the debate on whether it's all right that Dan's ye old English is succumbing to the cool automatica of American slang and usage. Let's talk about the new Lord of the Rings show from a writing perspective, the writer's job on film sets, and they answer several good questions badly, although to the best of their ability. Well, you recall their introduction. Find the Writer's Podcast on Facebook at Facebook backslash the Writer's Podcast, and feel free to email Sean and Dan with any questions, comments, or requests to have your work read on the show at hello sean and dan at gmail.com here they are now ladies and gentlemen careening from a long series of debacles only some of which involve the recent shared travesty of attempting to welcome you to their show dan and sean and dan So on today's podcast, we're going to talk about writing and basically anything that comes to our scrambled minds. We're also going to answer some questions about writing, writing novels, writing scripts, writing plays, anything you can think of. Send us your question. We have a lot of good questions this week, Dan. We have a question from Dirk. We have a question from Anne. We have a question from Scott. We have a question from Paul, and we're going to be attending to all those and giving uh 
really what just comes down to our opinions rather than what the truth of the matter is or really facts. I think you speak for yourself that I'm going to do facts. That's true. Uh, you always do think that you know, whereas I always think that I don't. And that's why this podcast is going to work. I don't think that I know. <laughs> a- anyway. Okay, here uh, is a question from Jay. And... Um, it's, it's a better question to see, but I'll describe it as it goes. Uh, how do you feel about the lack of capitalization and punctuation on social media, especially when they're, T-H-E-Y-R-E, no apostrophe, a writer, and seemingly because there is not longer a teacher to correct, they don't apply anything they learn. So all that is in lowercase, and all of that is an ironic uh, presentation of all the problems the questioner is uh, suggesting exists on social media. So no capitalization, no punctuation, misspellings, difficult to read. How do you feel about that? If I see a post that says, you know, 10,000 orphans die in massive blancmange factory and it's got an apostrophe in in orphans, Mm. that's what will bother me rather than the death of 10,000 orphans. So I'm a bad person. You are a bad person. I'm a bad person. What about the orphans then? Do you have any time for them? Fuck them. <laughs> You're just angry at this bad grammar. I yeah I, I mean I I find it I find it a bit irritating. I don't like I don't like bad grammar. But then uh, I think there are two things here. L- lots of writers, lots and lots of writers can't spell or do grammar. It doesn't matter. We've got computers can that can correct it for you now. Yeah. Um, al- although use the autocorrect and the spell check i mean if you're sending something to somebody and you want them to read it then for goodness sake just go to the effort of trying to spell it correctly Hmm. i have a slightly different feeling about the language used on social media whether it's punctuation capitalization new words uh acronymical type words rofl that kind of stuff i feel like there's sort of a birthing process that's always going on with language uh language is always evolving always changing and people not capitalizing things people spelling things wrong is all the spirit of language trying to refine itself trying to change trying to evolve it's almost to the point where if all of these things are misspelled there's no grammar and we're still able to read it maybe more fluidly than if it was capitalized and punctuated properly. But if it works better, we will adopt it eventually. So I think to a certain extent, all of these kinds of things are exploration of uh, the use of language and what works best. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if in 20 years we start dropping letters from words, <clears throat> you know, like in... England, you spell color, C-O-L-O-U-R. We drop that U because it's much easier over here. And we save a little moment of our time. Yeah. Just and glamour. You've also stuck with your O-U-R with glamour. It's just a you huge just waste of time. You just animals. You've just <laughs> lost the basic vestiges of we're, civilization. We're, we're speeding along over here in the United States. And over there, you guys are busy drawing U's. You <laughs> are. And we're all done. We're, so... Language is seeking felicity. Fast food. That's what. Yeah, just have. So, let's all have burgers instead of <laughs> instead of proper food. Yeah, let's all be American. Have burgers language and fries is seeking instead of bloody a, chips. Are not it, it, chips are chips <sighs> or potato chips like that you have with fish. They're not in a bag. That's crisps. You're, you're honestly. There's you've, you're. Is this the French fries? It's fight? just a sort of gradual the, the decline. Fries? of civilization in your country it's just i mean crisps for god's sake they're crisps man i can't say crisps it's ridiculous one day mate you know i lived in in ireland for a little while and they have the same bad words that you do actually i kind of like a lot of the words but i couldn't use them authentically so if i went into a place to get french fries i had a lot of trouble saying chips it just (laughs) felt like it was always in quotes there's a reason we don't have your version of chips over here. We have other words for chips. We're using it already. We're using it in many different places, chips. We can't add another um, bit to the dictionary, you know? 19. Also, it's a French fry. We're full up <laughs> with our chips. We have so many more chips than you, by the way. A thousand words for snow, a thousand words for chips. I think 
it depends on the accent, doesn't it? Because some things cannot be credibly said. There was a film called, well, I'm going to say it now, but it was it was Mo Better Blues. Oh, yeah. And I remember saying that to an American, saying it's called Mo Better Blues. And they just wet themselves. Yeah. Hello, <laughs> have you yeah. got any more better blues, please? <laughs> it just <laughs> it does sound like a... Yeah, well, that that's a title that almost invites you to speak it the way that the creator would say One it. thing that bothers me a, a little is that my daughter says gotten, which is not what English people say. English people say got, which is also occurs in Star Wars, actually. Alec Guinness says, your father shouldn't have gotten involved. And you can tell it's been written by an American for a ah. We say... You got involved. Shouldn't have got involved. So you never say gotten in, gotten anything. We don't. But my daughter says it because she's learned it from TV. So, so that, what about this? Have you gotten caught yet? No. You say mm. have you got caught yet? Although that's what I'm saying is um, my daughter and presumably other young people now starting to use it and. That does actually slightly bother me in the sense that because American English is dominant, like I, it pisses me off in a petulant way when the spell check corrects for American spelling mm. or grammar. And also because English is so difficult to spell mm. and English gr grammar is so difficult, it, unless you know what the English and the American versions of something are, you'll go with the spell check and you'll go with the American. And that means that the English versions will be lost. Hmm. which may or may not be a bad thing in the end. But as an English person, I feel a bit defensive about it. Let me just give you my condolences. I'm really sorry. Crisps, man. Crisps. Yeah. Yeah. They're crisps. Have you gotten the crisps? <laughs> <laughs> I love gotten. I think I think gotten's terrific. I like misbegotten. I, I think, I think yeah, well, if you like that, then you got to like gotten. But the thing <laughs> about gotten as opposed to gone is I do think there is a shade of meaning difference there. I do think gotten means something a little bit different than got. I think that mm -hmm. gotten is, you know, I don't know the form of the tense, but it's some sort of past participle or something like that. So if I say, have you gotten caught? Um, that speaks to, you know, a sense of time that extends in a little bit of a different way than have you got caught? Have you got caught is suggesting in the past, did you get caught? Have you gotten caught carries a little bit forth into the present moment. It's like you could almost get caught right at the at that moment. Um, mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. for that reason, because there is a shading of extra meaning, I think as an American that your daughter should use gotten and she is correct and you are old and lost. You've gotten lost, Dan. And you've gotten I'll all. allow it. I'll allow it. I mean, I, yeah, I hold my hands up. I, I have gotten lost. <laughs> I want to ask you something. Are you, what are you drinking there? That's one thing I want to ask you. It's a glass of water with a little bit of cranberry juice in it and several clinkety jingly ice cubes chosen mm, especially sure. for their noisomeness. You could just be pressing a sound effect. Who would have an ice cube sound effect button? Well, you know what? I probably have. I've got a massive bank of sound effects from when I was doing audio drama. Oh, you should play some of those for us. In the BBC, there used to be a spot effects department. And you'd go in there and there'd be beautiful little doors with full-sized catches on them and things for going in and out of doors in dramas. There were, I remember doing Dante's Inferno for Radio 4 and we had gravel wrapped in carpet. And we walked on that and that gave the sound of walking across snow and ice at the lake at the centre of hell. We had an umbrella for the devil's wings and things like that. It's great fun. Lo, there stands this. Here is the pass where you must summon all your fortitude. You know what's interesting to me about Foley or creating sound effects for audio productions and even film is how often not the thing is used you know so instead of recording you know actual feet on snow you record rocks and carpet or it's almost like the more convincing uh, version of feet walking on snow happens to be rocks and carpet that sounds more realistic it's not so much realistic as can you record it in a dead acoustic 
So can oh. you kill all the other sounds? Because what you want with a Foley recording or a film or radio, audio drama sound effect, you just want that sound and getting that is quite difficult. Mm. And so it's, you could go out and record someone's feet walking in snow, but then you have the whole world making noises and then you don't want to bring snow into the studio and walk on it because that's silly and hard and wet. Yeah. So really what you want to do is simulate it, but mostly you want to just remove the world and all of its muttering. Often you find things like a fireplace is very difficult to reproduce, I found, effectively, because it sounds like rain or it sounds like somebody crackling a bit of paper, but then also you can just crackle a bit of paper and it sounds a bit like a fireplace. Hmm. So there's a lot of faking going on, I, I found. Hmm. And I also think probably increasingly with the use of Foley, we've ceased to really know what the true sounds are. You know, so the sound of someone punching somebody else, we've probably come to associate that with some Foley artist who was slapping a bit of meat in a studio rather than an actual fist hitting a face, which we yeah. don't know what it sounds like anymore. We hear someone slap a little meat and we're like, who just got punched? <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. My children, when they hear a scream on TV, they will often surprise me going, oh, that's the Wilhelm scream. Wow. Because I told them about it when they were very little, being immersed in sound effects. And I, I don't know what the Wilhelm scream is. I mean, I'm assuming that it's some sort of well-known scream that everybody took and is now using. Is that right? It's a really interesting thing. It is a well-known scream, and it dates back from the 50s or something. And it's it just sounds like, ah! ah! And huh. what happened, I think, was people used it quite a lot. And then it became a thing to use it. So even modern productions now will use it almost as a sort of an in-joke. It's a scream. And oh. it was recorded by the guy who sang the song Purple People Eater, Jeb Woolley. <laughs> Jeb Woolley. I feel like I know that song so well that I should know that Sheb Woolley made it. But I don't know the Wilhelm scream or Sheb Woolley. Sorry, Sheb. Is it Sheb with a B? Yes, Sheb or, Woolley. I don't I think my van mouth's a bit dry. I can't say it properly. But yeah, the Wilhelm Scream, beginning in 1951 with the film Distant Drums, according to Wikipedia. <coughs> the scream is usually used when someone is shot, falls from a great height, or is thrown from an explosion. <coughs> the sound is named after Private Wilhelm, a character in the Charger Feather River, a 1953 western in which the character gets shot in the thigh with an arrow. This was its first use following its inclusion in the Warner Brothers Stock Sound Library. Although the charge at Feather River is believed to have been the third film to use the effect. The scream is believed to be voiced by actor Sheb Woolley. Huh. Oh, but it's not even really known. They just suppose it. He might have just claimed it as he was rising up his purple people eater uh, fame and just threw that out there to see if it helped. Hey, I did yeah. the Wilhelm scream too, guys, by the way, if you like purple people <laughs> eater. <laughs> welcome but, welcome to the Sound Effects Podcast. I'm your co-host, Sean, Atlantic Ocean, United States, and across from me. It's a podcast for artists who do sound effects by two old men who lend you a scream. I suppose with just noises inserted in films Door creaks and footfalls and shimmering dreams You can send us some water, a noise or a sound For tree falls in the forest, does it crash on the ground? The Sound Effects Podcast. You still, you had a question for me, didn't you, about something? And we got sidetracked. Yeah, I, no, I think that's a good diversion. I think it's quite fun. I'd like to hear from, if anybody knows anything more about the Wilhelm scream, please let us know. Or other instances of sound effects like that that have become the iconic delivery system. Maybe the Wilhelm scream isn't alone in the sound effects world. Yeah. So my question was, have you seen... The Rings of Power yet. I have not. This is the new Lord of the Rings TV yeah. show. I have not seen it. Go ahead. Tell us all about the, it. it. I guess the, this thing is so consequential. 
for those of us who work in fantasy, film and TV, because if it doesn't work, if it doesn't go well, the next meeting we have is going to be, well, fantasy doesn't work because Lord of the Rings didn't seem to work. And if it goes well, everyone's going to want fantasy. That's how it works. Is that how you feel about things, Sean? Yeah, I think that fantasy has always been a very precarious fictional landscape for television and film. I think the makers of such things think that fantasy is sort of niche and there have been a lot of bad versions of it that haven't done that well. I think Game of Thrones might have been the first giant proof that swords and dragons and, you know, magic, even though that wasn't a terribly magical show, that it could work in a big way. But I don't think that they are fully convinced, the they that we don't know, the, the they in power. And this Lord of the Rings definitely feels like if this works, then... There's floodgates. There's going to be so many variations of this coming along. Yeah, of course, what works is good script in any genre, but I would never have wanted to watch a thing about finance, but Succession is a masterwork, So even right. though you refuse to watch it. I watched the first two or three episodes, and I thought it was really great. I thought the writing was amazing and astonishing, but it also made me feel miserable. And sometimes in life, in my life, I don't want to watch things that make me feel kind of terrible. Sometimes I, I'm, I want to. I go through these different phases of what I want to consume. Sometimes it's just very light fare. Sometimes it's very heavy and dark. I think the thing about succession is that it's awful people having an awful life. And it's kind of watching the Trumps or the Murdochs destroy each other and themselves and be mm. miserable. And so it's kind of schadenfreude. That's what I enjoy about it. And I enjoy their hideousness, the kind of Baroque awfulness of the characters yeah i think i've had my fill of schadenfreude uh, at <laughs> least at least just for this yes this year my schadenfreude will renew of course as it does every year uh, but that's a few months off yet i'm not trying to be better than you by the way i fully enjoy some schadenfreude but i'm full at the, the thing about the lord of the rings the rings of power i mean again from a writer's point of view i was terrified for them I don't know them, the guys, the two guys who are show running it. I don't know anyone on that production, I don't think. But it's such a thankless task in some ways. I mean, hmm. fancy the audacity, the balls on them to take on making a writing a sequel to Tolkien or, hmm. or, or just dealing with such a beloved, intricate world and, and trying to make something of it. I think from an outsider perspective, it's pretty easy to think about that as the, that that sort of burdensomeness of taking something beloved that has a very spiky and ready to reply fan base who probably are going to hate what you do no matter what you do. But I think when you get down into the creative creator world, I don't think they think about that too much. I think they get their ideas going and then they feel good about them and excited about them. And they sort of leave off all that kind of broad broad thinking and just let it go and maybe now when it's done or as it's approaching release i would think those feelings thoughts worries would just come back like a, an army of horrible horses and if they did think about all that stuff all the terrible things i don't think they'd make a very good series i think they have to free themselves or probably did free themselves if it's good from those concerns yeah yeah is it good did you like it I did. I did like it. Yeah, I have to say, I think that anything that's not bad is a triumph. But I did enjoy it. I mean, it's not Tolkien, which I could have told you two years ago. It wasn't or when the idea was initially mooted. Of course, it's not Tolkien. And it's not true to Tolkien, which is another complaint that I've seen online. Of course, it's not true to Tolkien because he didn't write it. But it's got great performances. It looks incredible. It's the most expensive TV program of all time and it looks it in a good way it's really spectacular it's it it's 600 million dollars wasn't it the budget for the first season i've heard that it's actually a billion or something <laughs> all in or something but i think that's taking into account lots of other bits and pieces like distribution of i don't know what but it's certainly i mean they paid 250 million for the rights alone so 
I think the first season is at least 400 million. And I think this is the operative point. It's not cynical. It's not a desperate cash in and an attempt to jump on the coattails of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. It's well intentioned. It's sincere. There are bits that I'm not so keen on. And it overall has a slightly grimmer tone. It has some sort of cruelty and bits of darkness that aren't very Tolkien-esque, I don't think. But again, you, it can't be Tolkien. And if it was Tolkien, it would be bad. Nothing that gets adapted is the thing that was adapted. It's a separate thing. And it's going to be its own world. It's going to be more the world of whoever wrote it, whoever directed it, and whoever is in it. I mean, a uh, piece of film, whether it's television or, or cinema... Uh, is the people that made it more than what it was adapted from or who that person is or what their intentions were. It's a whole separate creation. It's They're taking Lord of the Rings. They're inspired by Lord of the Rings, but they're not making Lord of the Rings. They're taking it and running with it where they want to run. And to whatever degree they feel some sort of need to have some integrity with the original material, they'll have. I, I think that's very well said, yeah. So should we have a question we have a question from Scott, who writes, I'm writing a story which has two focal characters, a man and a cat. Would it be weird to switch to first person and present tense for the cat's chapters? I'm hoping to show how animals tend to live in the now, but I'm also on the fence because it may just come off as sloppy. I think that sounds like a lovely idea. And I don't think it comes up across as sloppy. Yeah, I think it's only sloppy if it's done sloppily. The concept itself is very compelling and i want to read that you know the, yeah, I think me too. one of the, one of the first things i feel is oh that sounds exciting i love this kind of this potential dynamic and the other thing is that it's not that's not a verboten kind of territory you can do what you want as long as it carries off so you can switch tenses you can switch first person third person you know you can tell the story in the present tense in one chapter and then go uh, in the next chapter, we're in the future and we're looking back on things. So there's no rule about how these things should be. The only real rule is that it, it, does it work? And to me, this is just a, an exciting idea. And <clears throat> I hope you do it. And if you do, uh, maybe you can send us a little bit and we can uh, kind of explore how well it's working. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, that would be a nice idea. And I think also when you're new to writing, you tend to think, oh, is this going to look bad? Of course you do, because you're worried, you're not expert, or you don't feel expert. I mean, you, I don't think you ever feel expert, but you, you, of course you're worried about these rules. The thing is just to try it and try it. If you're trying it with sincerity and it works, then fine. If you're being cynical and just trying to do something for a silly effect, if you're being sloppy, it'll come across sloppy, as Sean said. And if you're not, if you mean it, I think it's a clever way to show that cats live in the now or whatever. The, yeah. the golden rule in screenwriting is show, don't tell. If you can show it rather than saying explicitly the cat was living in the here and now or something. Yeah. You can show that in the in the tense. That's a clever way to do it. So yeah. I'm giving it a thumbs up. Yeah, two thumbs up from us, Scott. And that folds nicely into a question from Anne, who writes, I am currently attempting to write a series of fantasy books in a world I've been building. I have never attempted to publish anything in my life and have only recently become serious about completing a full story instead of just mucking about with unfinished pieces. I am mostly doing this for my own enjoyment and have written approximately two 800 single page books so far. However, I would like to share my endeavors at some point. So my question is, should I attempt to jump through all the hoops and deal with the headache of finding an actual publisher, or ought I attempt to self-publish, say on Amazon? And if I did decide to self-publish, would it still be possible to go the more traditional route afterwards, or do publishers frown on accepting works that have already been self-published? Okay, so I asked my friend Jane Johnson, who is an agent and publisher and author, and the answer is that if you self-publish, you're not likely to sell enough of the books to worry a publisher or an agent. So do self-publish. And I would say also, you've got to understand that, I, as I always say, the natural state of a writer is mortal terror. You're bearing your soul to strangers. So 
be realistic about that. If you're sending stuff to an agent or if you want to get published, do everything possible to get published. And that means write a list of all the agents you're going to send the stuff to, write a list of all the publishers, and I do both personally, compile that list, take a couple of weeks or whatever you need to do that carefully, then write to all of them and then forget about it and then self-publish. It's a really hard campaign to get your work out there in, in any form. And if you really want to do it, you need to use every possible tool at your disposal. This is my personal opinion. I'm not sure that there's a right way to do it. No, I completely agree with that. I don't, it's not going to harm you to publish on Kindle. They're not going to look and see, oh, well, you know, uh, Anne's already put out her books on Kindle. So A, we don't need to do it or B, it's, it's become public and she's ruined it. it. That's not how it works. If anything, it could help you a little bit. The one way it could help you is if, if your book became really successful in a kindly way, you know, if you sold a few thousand copies and got lots of good reviews, you could use that to help get a traditional publisher. They will look at those things if they reach a kind of threshold of success. Most books don't. Most self-published books aren't heavily bought or heavily seen or heavily reviewed. I read somewhere that there's 2,700 books per day self-published on Kindle, so it's very difficult to get anyone to see your stuff, but that's okay. I know Dan has a book out. Um, I've tried publishing in the past, or tried the traditional publishing route, sending letters off to agents, sending letters to publishing houses. Sometimes you get responses from them, but they're not usually very promising, and it's a bleak experience for most writers to try to get published in the traditional publishing world. It's very hard to get their attention, to get them to read anything. On the other hand, I do think there are some people who really know that what they're working on could be published by a traditional publishing house, that it just matches the zeitgeist of the moment. There, there are any number of, of sort of genres or almost stories that people are looking to publish at the current moment. And that sort of shifts over time as it's almost like what's trending on TikTok. You know, what's trending on TikTok, if you make a video in that trending location, you'll have a better chance of your video becoming viral. It's kind of the same thing in the world of publishing. If you can write a book that's like Girl on the Train, but is a little bit different than that, you have a better shot than if you write a story that nobody's really familiar with. So I would say do both. Prepare for silence in both areas, because... <laughs> You probably won't hear from agents or publishers, and you probably won't get a lot of people reading your stuff, but you can push it. You can promote it. I myself am awful at that part. Dan, I don't know how you feel, but I do think self-promotion in the self-publishing landscape is probably one of the biggest things that you have to do in order to get some success. But if you're not good at that, it's going to be a, a strange slog. My wife says my life is like being sacked every day. It really is. It's soul destroying. So you really got to prepare for it. Really, really think about what you're doing. Steal yourself, write your letters and then leave it. Forget about it. Yeah. You've got to remember that JK Rowling was rejected. I can't remember how many times for Harry Potter. I mean, everyone's been rejected and rejected. Even me, Sean. No one's going to believe that, Dan. No. <laughs> and you know what's weird is, so J.K. Rowling, when Harry Potter came out, she basically established a new genre of fiction in a way. And after her came thousands and thousands of books that kind of followed her model. And it was, it's a tonal thing. It's about the use of humor. It's about the funness of the experience, the breadth of the demographic, a book for kids and adults that was new. But before her, the reason it was so difficult for her to get through is there wasn't anything like it. And people were reading this going, eh, I don't, this feels strange to me. You know, Harry Potter, he lives in Fort Perth Drive, he's going to be a wizard. You know, nobody, nobody will want to read that. Because there hadn't been anything setting itself up behind that, that told an agent or whoever that this is a world that people want to hang out in. J.K. Rowling said, here's a world people want to hang out in, and eventually it was proved to be true. Yeah, yeah, and I also want to say a very important thing about following the zeitgeist is that 
you can go into a meeting and have something that looks very much like Harry Potter and they'll go, oh my God, this is great. It's like Harry Potter, but slightly different. This is going to be the new Harry Potter. Harry Potter is really popular. That's what we want. Or they might equally go, no, nah, it's too close to Harry Potter. Harry Potter has been, we're looking. For... So you can't win if you try and please these people. So again, what you have to do is just do write what you would write if no one was going to hear it or exactly. see it. Yeah. Write what you want to write. I think that's huge. And some people are lucky enough that they what they are writing is what other people want to read. And the, those people are, are, you know, sitting atop the bestsellers. I mean, there are Harry Potter sort of knockoffs or clones that work, and there are plenty that don't. But the ones that work are the ones that are bringing something sort of new to the table, something exciting, just a new idea thrown into the mix. And then that whole, and then that changes the zeitgeist. So maybe Harry Potter then becomes the old thing, and whatever this new writer has added into this, now it has werewolves, that becomes the new thing. And... It's this constant adding on and changing and these things morph over time. But yeah, if you have something to add to that and that's what's pulling you into writing, then I think you have extra reason to be excited if you're making use of a popular kind of story at the moment, but you're bringing something new to it. Uh, that's powerful. Yeah, cool. Also, very important, quick point before you have the next question. If you've written anything and you're considering putting it out, or you've finished any, anything, then well done. It's really yeah. difficult. So, you know, congratulations. Yeah, and a lot, 800 single space pages and two books so far is a feat. It is a huge feat. I have great respect for writers of every kind. I don't, you know, I because I think of it as a, it's, it's a life pursuit and we all share it. And so anybody else that's writing, that's a writer, they tell me they're a writer, it doesn't matter, you know, what, whatever level of success they've had. I just feel a little bit of kinship with them, and I'm sort of like, yeah, hey, we can talk. And if you're interested, if you publish that one or both of those books, please let Dan and I know, and maybe we can read a little bit of it on the show. Maybe that's a nice little thing. We can read bits of someone's writing out on the, on air, on the podcast. Yeah, I think that would be terrific. Cool. Let's have a next question. Okay. Here is a question from Dirk. I'm a decent writer. I just don't understand how to format a script. I have some amazing stuff upstairs. I just need to write it down. If you mean, uh, do, you, do you put fade in and all that? doesn't matter. Just get it down at all costs. Uh, if you mean, how do you structure a script, then... I would strongly advise you to read some books on it. And there is a huge prejudice against script writing books. And people say, you know, they make you formulaic and stuff like that, which is absolute garbage. Reading a book does not make you follow what it tells you to do. If you read a book on cookery, it doesn't make you make flans all the time. Knowledge is useful. You can reject it then, even if you don't like it. But standing on the shoulders of all the writers who went before you is what we all actually do. But somebody has taken the time to filter that and refine it into a set of instructions for you, which you don't have to follow. That is hugely time-saving. It's a terrific resource. And the, the book, that the blessed tome that I would recommend to you is Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. And the reason that I would recommend it is it's so economical. It just tells you, if you want to write a functional story, a functional script, this is what you do. Now, nobody in their right mind would follow that formula and write precisely according to what he says, put the inciting incident on page 12 or whatever. But it tells you what the norm is. It's the basics that you can then understand and you can reject bits of it or accept bits of it or maybe it'll tell you things that you already know and you might recognize. And what books like Save the Cat do is they really give you a sense of how stories move along. And so if you if you read Blake Snyder's Save the Cat, you'd see that there are whatever, there are 16 things that happen in a story 
And they're all like little turning points. And the danger of a book like Save the Cat is that you'll then take these things, the opening scene, <clears throat> the inciting event, whatever, and then you'll just use them like fill in the blanks. And, and in fact, probably the thing about the book that I don't like or about these things is that it does recommend that you come at your script from a fill in the blank kind of way. So you think about your story, you know, what is the dark night of the soul going to be? And that happens the three quarters of the way through your script. And usually in a dark night of the soul sort of thing, maybe somebody dies, you know, the old wise mentor or whatever. And the main character goes into this dark pit where they're not going to be able to do the thing that they need to do in the finale. So I would say that read something like Save the Cat to very quickly understand the kind of mechanical ways that stories can be created because they can be created other ways. You don't have to use that little formula, those ingredients to go from start to finish, but it's a really good way to think about it. So it helps you to start looking at the bigger picture. But I would say, I would caution you and anyone away from taking the, the beats, the 16 beats or 13, I can't remember what it is now. And before you, you know, do anything, just start filling those things out. What I would recommend is something more like the Quentin Tarantino approach, which is he likes to know what happens in the middle of his story. And once he's figured out what's happened in the middle, he just starts writing. He doesn't know how it's gonna, the whole story is going to end, but he knows what's going to happen in the middle. And what he says is that by the time he gets to that middle, the characters that he's created, they tell him where the story is going. They create the ending for him. And, you know, writers all have different approaches, but I like that idea more because then it leaves the whole concept of story to this collaborative notion of you and your characters and all the spirits and angels above you kind of working together, hauling the story itself across the finish line. Beautifully put as ever. I mean, you know, we're probably going to say this. If, if this show continues, we'll probably say this every episode. You just have to start writing. You just have to start writing it down. I would say read scripts. If you do want to write scripts, you should read scripts. And there's plenty of screenplays online. They tell you how to write differently. Than, so Save the Cat will tell you this sort of like overview thing, but the scripts themselves, you begin to see the way that screenwriters move from scene to scene, the language that they use, what a script looks like. What a script looks like is incredibly important in the big Hollywood land. So you can't write blocks and blocks of text and no white space. People that read things love white space. So you, it's, there's almost an aesthetic that you have to start learning about what a script looks like. And as far as the formatting part, like how do you format a script? Again, just take a look at scripts. There are programs out there that really help you do that. Final Draft is one I use. What is the one I use? Fade In. I use a program called Fade In. And it's just, all the formatting is there for you. So if you want to do a character, it puts the character, the cursor in the right position. If you're writing action, that puts it another. But so basic advice, read some scripts, read a how-to book, Save the Cat, but mostly just start writing. Yesterday, I went to a party and because I go to parties all the time because I'm not popular. a old man. I'm hugely popular. <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't. A, it was just my friend's birthday. And in rural Cheshire where nobody, you, you know, not you don't expect anyone in kind of writing or the business, show business sort of to be. But in fact, there are quite a lot of people floating around. And I met a stunt coordinator and she was asking me about the role of the writer on set. And she was telling me about a scenario where a writer and a director were both on set. And the, I think the writer was voicing things when not asked by the director. And we were talking about that. And I was saying that when I'm working with a director, when I'm not directing, I'm just writing. I say to the director, I'm here if you want me. And then I sh shut up. I mean, I'll say, I'm not going to say anything unless you ask me. But sometimes a director will, will want that interaction, a sort of deep interaction with a writer, I think. And sometimes they won't. And sometimes they don't even want you on set. I imagine that's that's less likely in TV, isn't it? In, especially in US TV. 
I think it's very personal. It comes down to the director. And there are some directors that want everybody <laughs> to be helping, you know, so they're open to the actors making suggestions. They're open. They always want the writer there to confirm or to help. Or if there is this working, should we rewrite this? Can we do this or that? In the U.S., I think that the writer is maybe even by contract obligated to be on set during the filming of something that they've written. And I, you'll often see the writer will get like some kind of other credit for episodes that they've written. Of, so if you're on the writing staff of a series, there are certain things that are usually kind of guaranteed, not just being on the writing staff, but that you get, you'll get to write an episode or two or whatever that con, con, you're contractually allowed to do. And for those episodes that you wrote, you would then be on set. And I think you're often given a credit like supervising producer. And I don't know if that's a complete rule that, you know, the writers will be there, but that's what it seems to be as far as I understand it. Mm. And usually the directors don't really want you. A general rule of thumb is they probably know what they want to do and you don't need to help them. <laughs> Unless yeah, they unless ask. they want you to. Yeah, yeah, unless they ask. I also think that the actors, I find the more famous an actor is, the more scared they are of looking stupid. Mm. So they will look round to you as the director. And if they, they need to be looking at one person to see, do I look stupid? Am I doing this wrong? They want reassurance from one person. They don't want it from two people. Yeah. They need to know who's in charge. It's like a, it's like a ship, isn't it? You've got to know who's, which direction you're going. And someone's got to say that. Yeah, and that is a that is actually a, a huge thing that the director provides to actors is he or she is protecting them from all sorts of things, whether it's the reading of a dramatic line to simply walking. You know, so if the, if an actor walks a little weirdly or does something strange that you know just a regular viewer might go, "Oh, look at that! Are his pants falling down." The director will <laughs> protect you from everything as much as they're there to tell the story and direct everything. They're there protecting the actor. That's crucial. They need to know that absolutely you, you're going to look after them. Yeah. And so that sort of bond of trust is very important. Yeah, and I think actors a lot of time work like to work with directors who are very good at that, are very good at protecting them. Maybe even more so than like, we made a great film together. Could be, hey, you really made me look cool. good. Have we, have we got another question? We have another question. It's very Zen-like. It's a question from Paul. Where do you start, Paul writes. And then this was on our Facebook page, The Writer's Podcast. You can find our Facebook page, Facebook slash The Writer's Podcast. And I asked him, what do you mean by where do you start with writing? I didn't know if there was something that he was thinking about specifically. And then he wrote back, it was just a general question. But if one did have an idea, is it just a case of, in quotes, once upon a time? I think... Are you making a breath? Are you going to start this one, Sean? Go on, you start this one. Um, no, you breathed. Go on. I did. I did breathe, which is a conversational gesture. Yeah. I think I was going to say, do you, do you have any thoughts on that, Dan? But I am actually a big fan of starting things off with Once Upon a Time, or it was a dark and stormy night, very cliche, either fairy tale or bad detective book, because it is so hard to sometimes start writing. It's fine and fun to use this language that we all know is language of the world of storytelling just to get there. It's like a little doorway in. If Once Upon a Time opens you up to what happened Once Upon a Time, then, you know, write Once Upon a Time and then go, and then later on you can remove it, but maybe you want to keep it because there's something sweet about that. Once upon a time it was a dog and stormy night Too dark for me to see And so the end But starting is such a... How do you start anything? You know, you just do it. And how, I guess it's like, how do you, Paul, do things? You know, if you are starting an exercise program, how do you start that exercise program? And if you are, uh, you know, going on a diet, not that you need to, I don't know you. Paul, you better get on a diet quick. Uh, do you <laughs> read books on how to start a diet? Or do you just throw away all the food in your refrigerator? 
or do you tell all your friends that you're starting a diet and not to invite you out to dinner anymore? If you haven't started writing and you want to start writing, you're going to have to figure out the little things that get you going, whether it's going and buying a notebook, a pen, whether it's setting a little time aside for yourself every day to write, starting a journal. I mean, a really great way to start writing is a journal. You don't have to think about the journal as the beginnings of your novel. Just get ink on paper or just get virtual ink on your computer screen. Just start writing. I said it again. Yeah, and don't feel that you have to start at the beginning. You can... Just if you've got half an idea, write it down. It might be useful later if you think you might have a story. You want to you want to do a story about cats. Write down cats or something, and then think. You know, give yourself a break. Start where you can. Remember, it's very difficult. So acknowledge that and just do whatever works. And also, I ought to admit, Sean. Do you know what the first line of my novel, The Minister of Chance, is? Once upon a time. Yeah. I just, Dan, it, uh, I'm charmed by that. I don't find it a, a like a cliche or anything. It's just uh, a, it's an early signal flare. What you're about to read has a fairy tale component to it, and that's sweet. Cool. I'll take sweet. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, sweet. I'm gonna leave a one star review on Amazon for Minister of Chance, <laughs> and I'll write sweet. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take anything I can get. Thanks very much for listening. That's the end of the second episode of the Writer's Podcast with me, Dan Freeman, and Sean Hurley across the Atlantic. I can't believe we got this far. It's amazing that we've come so far, Dan. Our thanks go out to Jay and Dirk and Anne and Paul and Scott. And if any of you latter questioners or really anyone out there in the audience wants to hear Dan and I do a little audiobook slash radio drama performance, of your work, please feel free to send us an email at hello Sean and Dan at gmail.com. Subscribe to the Writer's Podcast on iTunes and join our Facebook group at Facebook backslash the Writer's Podcast. And ask us something, send us something, or just keep a close eye out on all our gotten and misbegotten and mo better blues. It's a podcast for writers who write and who wrong. But to bold men who lend you a pen I suppose we're all readers to drop through the page To the far side, now we're wandering strange You can send us a question, a story or a poem The trail through the forest, but how to get home The Writer's Podcast.